Tactical rescue is a very expansive response and can be dangerous if not properly executed. In this presentation, you'll learn about what it looks like for the three most common disciplines, what to stay away from, and how you can help. Individuals interested in furthering their education in technical rescue, we recommend that you find a local NFPA technical rescue class that suits your desire. In this program, we'll cover the laws and standards governing technical rescue, as well as briefly cover the rescue disciplines of rope, confined space, and trench rescue. Within each one of these disciplines, we'll cover the systems and components, hazards, and various response considerations. Technical rescue is heavily governed by federal and state regulations. On the federal side, you have OSHA. OSHA is a federal organization that creates laws and statutes that we have to follow in technical rescue. States may have their own programs or may be overseen by federal OSHA. Either way, states can supersede federal law. And we will be discussing some of these regulations as we go along. Another regulatory body, known as ANSI, is a nonprofit that oversees the standards and conformity assessment systems to our gear. Where we'll see ANSI standards are the personal protective equipment that we have for technical rescue. However, they are not a regulatory body. Another organization that you need to be familiar with with technical rescue is NFPA. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the NFPA, who they are and what they do, but they are also a nonprofit that they create codes and standards to which most organizations follow. Now, to break down a lot of these standards, codes, or laws, on the federal side, we have several CFRs, otherwise known as Code of Federal Regulations. 1910.132 outlines what kind of personal protective equipment is required. 1910.120 outlines hazmat response. 1910.146 outlines regulations for confined spaces. In subsection K, it refers specifically to rescue companies. 1926-650 through 652 outlines trench. Now this might not spell out trench rescue as it applies to rescue companies. It does specify what a trench is and how we have to operate near them. Now once again, Pay attention to your state laws because they may supersede federal OSHA. On the NFPA side, you have 1670, which is the operations and training, 1006, which are the qualifications we have to adhere to, and 1983, which is the life safety rope and equipment standard. NFPA 1670, which is a standard for operations and training of technical rescue, outlines the different response levels that we have. Awareness, Operations, and Technician. Today's content will purely be talking about awareness level. NFPA 1006 is a standard for technical rescuer professional qualifications. Essentially what this is, is it breaks down the minimum job performance requirements you need to get certified. NFPA 1983 is all about rope. Now it's pretty expansive, but it covers everything we need to know from buying software and hardware, which we'll talk about later, to maintenance and end-of-life requirements. All right, now that we're beyond all of the standards and regulations, let's move into the actual disciplines. First, starting with rope. In rope, we have two different types of rescue, either high angle or low angle. On high angle, it's vertical. Essentially, with high angle, the load is predominantly supported by the rope. In low angle, it's going to be a gradual incline or decline. The load is predominantly supported by itself and not the rope. Now the big thing about rope rescue, especially the rope rescue technician certification, it's kind of the parent discipline to all the other disciplines. We use rope rescue in confined space, trench, structural collapse, water rescue, tower rescue, and so many more. In rope, some of the personal protective equipment you're going to see, one being helmets. Helmets, for obvious reasons, protect your heads from slips, trips, or falls. Gloves. We don't want bare hands on rope. We also have other pinch points on some of the hardware or equipment we use, so we definitely want to keep gloves on. Safety glasses. We need to keep our eyes safe. With rope, there's lots of moving pieces, lots of moving components. Even if you're on a vertical or a sloped incline, there could be lots of debris that could be kicked up, so we want to make sure our eyes are protected. Harness. And we'll talk about harnesses here in just a little bit. But harnesses are going to protect the rescuer from sudden fall. And lastly, foot protection. Now this is gonna be incident specific. 
Because if you are out on a sloped incline, you probably want a boot that's a little bit more sturdy. But if you're doing something like tower rescue, you want something a little bit more agile. The big thing with personal protective equipment is that if you're responding to this incident, and you're going to be taking part of the actual operations, you need to wear the appropriate PPE for the scenario. Now let's get into some of the equipment. Harnesses. Harnesses, there are three different classifications. A class one harness is a waist style, for, and it's primarily used for emergency escape or for one person loads. A class two harness has that same waist strap, but then includes some sort of seat style strap. And this is going to be more for one to two person loads. A class three harness is a class two, but includes a chest strap. This full body harness is going to be more supportive for any kind of inversion protection, as well as extended working on a vertical load. Now, the rope, the most important part of rope rescue. Rope can be made of two different types of materials, either natural or synthetic. Some of the natural fibers you might see out there are manila and cotton. Nylon rope is generally used for rope rescue. However, a polypropylene will add some sort of buoyancy for water rescue. Now, all ropes have varying construction. What you'll see is a laid, braid, braid on braid, or kern mantle. Kern mantle probably being the most popular for rope rescue. The size of construction affect the weight rating. So if we look at the smallest diameter rope for rope rescue, which is 3 8 low stretch Kerr mantle, has a weight rating of 4,500 pounds. Now with rope rescue, it's important that whatever rope we're putting a life on has to be rated for life safety. We cannot use utility rope off of our engines and suspend a life on the end of it. With rope, there are four basic rules we all have to adhere to. Number one, don't step on the rope. You see that happen all the time. Be cognizant of where your feet are and ensure not to step on it because it can damage the rope. Number two, don't straddle the rope, especially when there's a load on it because that could affect what that rescuer is doing. Number three, protect the rope from sharp edges. For obvious reasons, we don't want to cut the rope when there's any kind of weight on it. And number four, avoid exposure to chemicals because chemicals could degrade the fibers. All personnel, regardless of certification, have to adhere to these rules. Otherwise, catastrophe could occur. Now let's get into webbing. Webbing is used for lots of different things in the fire service. For rope rescue, it's used to build anchor systems, create harnesses, and to package victims. You'll find two different types of webbings, either flat or tubular. The minimum breaking strength for tubular one inch is gonna be about 4,500 pounds. For tubular two inch, 8,000 pounds. And for flat one inch, 6,000 pounds. Now the carabiner. The carabiner is nothing more than a shackle that compon connects components together. With carabiners, there's various sizes, styles, weights. Most important, that in whatever carabiner we are using has to be rated for life safety and whatever weight we're gonna put on the system. You can't just go down to the hardware store and pick up whatever cheap carabiner. It has to be rated for the purpose. On a rope, you can either go up or you can go down. If you're going down, you need a descent device. The most common for repelling is called a figure eight, which is a friction-based device. Next, you have a brake bar rack. A brake bar rack is a little bit different in the fact it's adjustable, where your rope, rope moves over different adjustable brakes depending on what load you need to support on it. The brake rack is the most common for rope rescue. Next, you have what's called an MPD, which is a mechanical advantage pulley system. This is relatively new to the market and slowly adding its way into system components. An MPD is slowly taking over the figure eight for single rescuers, but is most often used in tower rescue. Now, if you need to go up on a rope, you need an ascending device. An ascender allows a rescuer to go up a rope without assistance. Now, these devices have a cam in it that prevents the rescuer from going back down the rope. And the last of the equipment that we'll cover on the most common pieces of rope rescue equipment are pulleys. Now we all know what pulleys are, but the beautiful thing about pulleys is that when we combine them together, we can increase mechanical advantage, which overall decreases how much effort we have to put in. Now, like all the other devices we've talked about, these devices need to meet the standards set forth by NFPA and ANSI. So systems, some of the systems you'll see out there, you'll see two on every rope rescue, one is a mainline. 
Main line is a primary rope line for the rescuer and for retrieval. A belay is a contingency system in the event that the main line fails, the rescuer and or victim do not drop. And you may see a haul system. A haul system is usually supplemented onto a mainline system that allows the rescuer and or victim to be ascended with minimal effort. With a haul system in place, it usually involves a third rope. Now you've responded to a situation that requires rope rescue. Now without having a rope rescue system, a rope rescue group or certified personnel, there's not much you can do here. But regardless, the first thing anybody can do is make sure the scene is safe. If we have more people fall down or uh, succumb to the vertical descent that the victim did, we can't help. We also need to ensure the appropriate resources are dispatched. If your department does not have a rope rescue plan in place, then you need to get a team there. If you do have a plan in place, but you need to be supplemented by another organization, or you just might need them, then you might want to get that resource started as well. As kind of stated in making sure the scene is safe, we want to isolate the area to only train personnel. Once we have the people there who know how to use the system, we try to make it as clean as possible. And then if we need to supplement operations with awareness or operation level trained people, we can do that easily. We also need to establish a victim location. So while those resources are coming, if you're the first arriving crew there, find out where the victim is, so that way we can start a plan in place immediately. As tempting as it may be, if you've responded to an incident that requires rope rescue, if you have not had the training, don't have the resources, or the proper equipment, it would be much more efficient and effective to wait for trained personnel, because would-be rescuers account for several deaths every year. Now let's move on to confined space. So what is a confined space? OSHA has put this into three simple sentences. Number one is large enough and so configured that an employee can bodily enter and perform assigned work and has limited or restricted means of entry and exit and is not designed for continuous occupancy. So OSHA has described two different types of confined spaces. You either have a non-permit or permit required. Both of these we'll go into now. Now a non-permit confined space meets the definition that OSHA gave us earlier and has no additional hazard. Now the key part of that are no additional hazards. Now some examples of non-permitted confined spaces would be equipment closets, crawl spaces, and even ventilated tunnels. Now a permit required confined space is different because it has to meet one or more of the following. Number one, contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Number two, it contains a material that has the potential of engulfing a patient. Number three, it has internal configuration where the entrant could be asphyxiated or trapped by inwardly converging walls or a floor which slopes downward and tapers to a smaller cross section. And lastly, it contains any other recognized serious safety hazard. Now here you'll see various permit required examples. Now some of these examples can be found almost anywhere in your first response jurisdiction. You can see a diesel tank. You can see grain silos. You also have a hopper. In that hopper you see the inwardly converging walls that come down to a smaller cross section. All of these confined space permit examples can be very deadly. So if you've responded to an incident that appears to be a confined space, Understanding if it's permit required or not permit, we'll cover in a second. However, there are two different types of rescue you can do. The first is non-entry rescue. If you have a victim who has a lifeline, tagline, whatever you want to call it, attached to them, rescuing that person could be as simple as pulling them out. As long as we do not breach the plane of the confined space, we're fine. Now, if you have to make entry, you have to follow federal law. If it is a non-permit required, it's a little bit easier. But if it's permit required, it becomes a little bit more challenging. So what is a permit? A permit is going to be a document that your technical response team will have, or anybody who's authorized to make confined space. It is a document that goes through certain procedures, analyzes what the confined space is or the problem is, then is signed off by whoever's in charge. For us, it would usually be an incident commander. The basis of the permit are just ensuring that 
We've identified all the hazards and account for all the personnel. And it only takes a couple minutes to fill out. Confined spaces have a plethora of atmospheric hazards, some more common than others. But to go name a couple, we're going to have low or increased oxygen content, flammable gases, toxic substances, contact hazards. But realistically, there are many hazards out there. Now let's quickly take a look of air and oxygen content. Normal air is roughly 20.9% oxygen, a majority of it made up of nitrogen. A deficient atmosphere in oxygen is anything from 19.5% to lower. Enriched oxygen is going to be anything 23.5% and higher. OSHA and NFPA, 19.5% is the minimum requirement before respiratory protection is required. So let's look at oxygen deficiency. It's probably the most relevant to us in the fire service. Oxygen deficient atmospheres are anything below 19.5%. The minimum life saving percentages are anywhere from 16 to 19.5%. Below 16%, it's hard to sustain life. Now, the signs and symptoms of an oxygen deficient environment are headache, light, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, cyanosis, and sweating. So, what causes an oxygen deficient environment? rusting and metallic parts, combustion, inert gases like nitrogen, gases from welding and cutting, bacterial action, and microbial decomposition. Now aside from oxygen deficient environment, toxic substances are very common in confined spaces. Some of these toxic substances, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide. Of the two largest killers the people in confined spaces, carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide kill the most. Of these two, carbon monoxide, otherwise known as CO, derives from incomplete combustion. H2S, otherwise known as hydrogen sulfide, generally comes from organic decomposition. It's also known as sewer gas and has the smell of rotten eggs. The personal protective equipment that you'll usually see in confined spaces are gonna be a helmet, helmet for obvious reasons. We wanna keep the head safe from bumps, falls, trips, falling debris, gloves to keep our hands protected, respiratory protection. Now you could see anything from an SCBA to Saba, which is a supplied air breathing apparatus we'll talk about later, a harness similar to rope rescue for entrance and retrieval, a lifeline and flash or fire protection gear if there is a flammable hazard. Now let's talk about some of the common pieces of equipment you'll see at a confined space rescue. The first being a harness. It's a class three harness, very similar to what you see in rope rescue. The purpose being, it allows the rescuer to access vertical spaces and also allows the rescuer to be retrieved in the event of emergency. Next, we have tagline. Tagline will be affixed to the back of every confined space rescuer's harness. The purpose is it allows for quick retrieval in the event of emergency. Now that tagline has to always remain in place unless the tagline is hampering operations. At that point, it can be removed but use extreme caution because that is your lifeline. Respiratory protection. Not all confined spaces require respiratory protection. If the space is being ventilated and that atmosphere is clean, then we may not need it. And we'll talk about that in a second. If you do need it, you have two options, either SCBA or Saba. SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus that we're all familiar with, has some limitations. First is you're limited to a tank and a time. Second is you have a big piece of equipment on your back and you're in a confined space. Next, you have SABA, which stands for Supplied Air Breathing Apparatus. Now, a SABA, the rescuer wears a mask similar to an SCBA face piece, but has a long continuous air hose that goes to an external compressed air tank. Now, the rescuer will usually have an escape bottle in the event that the SABA system fails. Another piece of equipment that's bread and butter to confined space rescue is a tripod. A tripod is a three-legged high point that allows rescuers to enter vertical space. Now, a tripod can have winches attached to it, or you could use a rope system. The advantages of a winch is they're easy, they carry mechanical advantage, and there are less moving parts. Atmospheric monitors are crucial to our safety. They monitor the air for certain different types of hazards. Most of us carry atmospheric monitors or gas detectors on our rigs. 
Most gas detectors or atmospheric monitors come with these either three or four sensors. If it's a three sensor, it usually has carbon monoxide, oxygen, and LEL, also known as lower explosive limit, for flammable ranges. If it has a fourth cell, it is usually for hydrogen sulfide, otherwise known as H2S, but this can be configured on your gas detector. Either way, gas detectors come in two different modes, either passive or sample. If it's passive, it means that it's waiting for air or whatever is in the atmosphere to come in contact with the cells. These generally take up to 30 seconds for a true reading. If it's in sample, it means it has a pump included and it's actively drawing air onto those cells, which are generally immediate. To help prevent or create an atmosphere that is safe for rescuers, we can use a fan. And the fan usually has a blower and then tubing. You usually see these driving down the road when you see utility workers going into a sewer. These fans should be intrinsically safe, but the point of it is putting fresh air into the atmosphere and pushing the negative stuff out. Now let's talk about a comm system, otherwise known as communications. You can have a portable radio. However, with your portable radio, you may have troubles getting out of the area, especially if you're on a trunked, uh, repeated system. You also have to worry if your radio or your lapel mic is intrinsically safe. The most beneficial for confined space communications is a hardline communication system. These usually integrate with your Saba and have a microphone that's either in your mask or on your throat. You can also use these systems to communicate with the attendant who's outside monitoring the rescue, the victim, and the rescuers all at the same time. If your agency has responded to an incident that looks like it could be a confined space rescue, I urge extreme caution. We have to slow down and do it right. When you look at all of the deaths out there, both in our industry and in the civilian life, upwards of 60% sometimes are would-be rescuers. If you believe that you're responding to a confined space incident, you should try to ensure that the appropriate resources are dispatched as early as possible. Once you're on scene, the first thing we can do is make sure the scene is safe. After we do that, we can look and try to establish a victim location. We also want to isolate and deny entry to only trained personnel. We also want to keep running equipment at least 100 feet away from the entry site. The reason being is we don't want carbon monoxide or any other gases to enter the site even with the blower. Also, we want to control hazardous source energies. So if there is a water line going through, can we have it shut off somewhere down the line? Same with electrical, pneumatic, hydraulic, any kind of hazard source. We also, if possible, can initiate a non-entry rescue. If there's a tagline, let's try to immediately do that. So realize this, if you are not a trained rescuer on this incident type, there are lots of things that you could be doing to help support rescue operations. Now let's move on to trench rescue. So the first question is, is, what is a trench? A trench is defined as a narrow underground excavation that is deeper than it is wide and is no wider than 15 feet. But the biggest thing to take away there is a trench is deeper than it is wide. As long as we know that, we can identify a trench. A trench may meet OSHA requirements for confined space, so if you're going to make entry, start thinking about that permit. So let's get into soil types. Soil types all across the nation are different, but soil types will drive our incident response because it'll show us where our risk liability is. The soil types are class A, B, and C. Class A soil is the most stable, and usually what it is is clay, silt clay, and hard pan. Now, it's very imperative that no soil type A can be an A if it's fissured, if it's subject to vibration of any kind, if it's been previously disturbed, so it's not virgin soil, and has any seeping water. If it meets any one of those, it can't be an A, it will be either a class B or a class C. A class B soil is silt, sandy loam, and medium clay, probably arguably one of the most common soils in America. They usually are unstable dry rock and previously disturbed soils unless classified as C. Now, to finish it up, class C, this is the least stable of all the soils. It's usually composed of gravel, loamy sand, soft clay, and submerged soil or dense, heavy, unstable rock. This soil, if it has water seeping freely, is definitely a Class C. Soil types are extremely important. 
because depending on the stability of the soil will show you your risk potential of another collapse or uh, further incidents. So if it's a type A soil, that'll have maximum stability. B and C have less, C obviously being the worst. Now, with you being a first responder, and if you are not with a technical rescue team, identifying the soil type and relaying that information to the responders will help them start thinking about processes or resources that they'll need to call ahead of time. Regardless of your training when it comes to trench rescue, understanding soil types in your jurisdiction can be extremely important, as well as understanding any construction activities that have previously disturbed the soil. Understanding these will show you your risk potential within your first due uh, and your possibility of potentially having a trench rescue. Now, obviously, trench is all about dirt. So let's get into some dirt dynamics. One cubic foot of dirt weighs roughly 100 pounds. One cubic yard of dirt weighs roughly 2,700 to 3,500 pounds. So now the question is, is how does this affect the victim? What we're gonna see is we're gonna see engulfment and suffocation. We're gonna see crush injuries and broken bones as a result of all this pressure. So let's look at some trench terminology. A spoil pile is the dirt that was in the trench and is now mounted up outside the trench. The lip is roughly two feet on top, two feet below the sideways line of the trench. The face is going to be the sidewall of the trench. The toe will be the bottom roughly two feet of the trench. And the floor is obviously the floor of the trench. Now, trench accidents. Trench accidents we can put into three of the top. The first one's going to be a spoil pile slide. Second, a slew-in or cave-in. And then lastly, a sidewall shear. A spoil pile slide is where the spoil pile, also known as the dirt that was in the trench is now mounted up on top, slides back into the trench. Some of the causes from this could be uh, mechanical as in an excavator pushes it back into the trench. It could be vibration. Uh, just the soil type slows back in. A slew-in, otherwise known as a cave-in, the face of the wall or the side wall ends up breaking apart and slowing into the trench. The causes for a trench accident like this could be anything from poor soil type, mechanical, vibration, or just disturbed soil that eventually breaks apart. A sidewall shear is exactly as it sounds. The sidewall shears from the trench and falls down inside. The causes of this are very similar to the first two trench incidents that we talked about. So the personal protective equipment that you'll generally see on almost all trench incidences are a helmet, helmet, protect our head from uh, falling objects, swinging objects. Gloves, protect our hands because we're gonna be using tools, be working with nails and other pieces of equipment. Boots to protect our feet and the bottom of our soles. Harness, very similar to the other two disciplines. That way a rescuer can be extricated from the hole. And then a tagline, same thing. It's a lifeline, very similar to confined space. Now let's look at some of the equipment that you'll see on scene. What you'll see are shoring. Now shoring are any kind of device that helps put pressure either vertically or horizontally to keep something intact. With shoring, we'll see manual. Manual is either gonna be pipe or wood, pneumatic or hydraulic. Now shoring is designed to keep the trench from collapsing back inward. We also see shoring in structural collapse training to keep the roof from falling in. You'll also see plywood, fin form, which looks like plywood, and dimensional lumber. You'll see carpentry tools because this is very carpentry related. You'll also see airbags and related equipment to help fill uh, spaces and, and put external pressure where it's needed. Of these systems and manual shoring, wood is probably the most predominant. And of wood, we have two different ways, either cut to fit, where it is exactly as it sounds, you cut it until in the right position that it fits, or we also have Ellis screw jacks that are adjustable. We can also use metal, as in Schedule 40 pipe, with screw jacks to help put pressure as shoring devices. Looking at pneumatic struts, pneumatic struts are set with compressed air. Once the struts are set at the correct pressure against the walls, they are then pinned and the air is disconnected. Hydraulic shores are just as that. They are set with hydraulic pressure. They can be single shores or a whole collapsible and extended system. They're probably the least popular in public safety, but arguably the most popular in public works. 
Now hazards. Hazards associated with trenches can be pretty big in the fact that we can create further trench collapse. So we want to stay back from the lip as we talked about earlier in the terminology. Sheeting distributed across the lip can help with that by distributing the weight and allowing us to walk a little bit closer. We always want to approach from the end of the trench or the spoil pile because those are going to be the strongest areas. And lastly, if we have somebody working in a trench, is there a possibility that we have a utility line or something else has been breached? If so, we have to address those hazards as well. Now, as your agency responds to what looks to be a trench rescue, the first thing we should always do, as we talked about in the others, is ensure the appropriate resources are dispatched. Once we arrive, we want to make that scene as secure and safe as possible. We also want to isolate the site to only train personnel. Now, if you're trained to the awareness level like this, or operations, this is where you can be used for manpower, cutting, distributing, helping with the workload. We also want to keep running equipment at least 300 feet back. The reason being is we don't want vibration from that to help cause further trench collapse. We also want to control any hazardous energy. For example, if there's a utility line in that trench that's been breached, we want to control that as quick as possible. Establish a victim location, and if we can perform non-entry rescue, for example, pulling on that tagline to get them out, let's do that as quick as possible. Now, most trenches occur near roadways, so if we want to create an isolation perimeter, let's involve law enforcement as well to help secure that. As you can see reoccurring themes in this presentation, the equipment, the training, the personnel are all very heavy. And so in order to have a technical rescue program for your organization requires a lot of resources. The number one priority with all these incidents are safety. Not only safety for the victim, but safety for responding personnel. And let's urge a lot of caution when it comes to training. If you're not trained, let's try not to affect the rescue. We also want to deliver services in accordance with OSHA, state regulation, and NFPA standard. Technical rescue is a very expansive discipline. When done properly, it can be extremely beneficial. However, if you're not trained to the technician level or operations level, there's still a lot you can do because manpower needs are always going to be there.